Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Catherine A. H. Graham Lecture on Indigenous Policy. I'm Andre Plod, Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs. As we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are guests on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. This acknowledgement is especially important today as we host our annual lecture on Indigenous Policy. The Catherine A. H. Graham Lecture was established in 2009 to honor Catherine's deep commitment to the sustainability of Indigenous communities through public policy and citizen engagement. It's something she emphasized as Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs from 2003 to 2009. The Graham Lecture provides a vehicle for examining a wide range of policy issues, cases, models, and tools related to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities across Canada. Over the years, we have been privileged to host a number of Indigenous experts who have furthered our understanding of public policy and of matters of relevance to public policy within an Indigenous context. I am sure you will find this year's speaker to be no exception. And now, it is an honor for me to introduce John M. H. Kelly, or Cleals, his Haida name, to this gathering. John Cleals M. H. Kelly was a full-time professor in the School of Journalism and Communication. Since retirement, he has served as an adjunct research professor in the school. He is also co-director of CIRCLE, Carleton University's Center for Indigenous Research, Culture, Language, and Education. John is a member of the university's Indigenous Education Council. He has worked with Indigenous language and cultural revitalization and preservation programs for 25 years. He is also one of 15 researchers designated by the Federal Department of Canadian Heritage as a leading authority on language and cultural revitalization. John is Haida from Skidigit Village in Haida Gwaii, a group of lush, rainforested North Pacific Islands about 80 kilometers off the coast of British Columbia. I would like to offer, invite John to offer a traditional greeting. With introductions like that, I don't know what to do. But thank you. I'm, I feel very honored. Kulchad Kanga. Just like Anga, the tackle in Kaisis. Esteemed women, esteemed men, dear friends, it's a pleasure to be here, especially because of what the topic is. This is something that has not been touched on enough. Native people, we've had our standards on the land, and the land and the environment, the protection of the environment comes first. It's good to see it being taken up by the universities. I came to Haida Gwaii, to my home, by means of working in South Dakota and I was pretty close to the Lakota, and I got adopted in by a brother, Robert Gray Eagle. And Robert was a tremendous inspiration to me. But at that time was when I developed an interest in finding out what my own cultural roots were. And I came across an old Lakota prophecy. It's a seven generations prophecy that said that the newcomer, the white man, will not listen to us for seven generations. But in the seventh generation, they will start to come to us to see what to do about what's going on in the world. And I believe that that prophecy is coming to pass. So I'm deeply honored to do this introduction for Deborah. And I'm really, really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. 
So thank you for your attention, your time, and enjoy this, the meeting. And I know you're going to gain a lot out of it, and I know I will. So how hasta? Thank you to a man of great respect. How a Gulchat. Thank you to women of great respect. And how a Salana. Salana is the word for the Creator. Thank you, Creator, Spirit that lives above the shining heavens for this day. Keep our hearts open and our minds clear and make this a productive session. We ask for that because we know that that's your heart and as well as ours. Hawa. Thank you, John, for your uh, very thoughtful and inspiring words. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Warswick, and I'm the Associate Dean Research and International for the Faculty of Public Affairs. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for the 2019 Catherine Graham Lecture on Indigenous Policy. Deborah McGregor is an associate professor and holds the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Environmental Justice at York University, where she is cross-appointed to both the Osgood Hall Law School and the Faculty of Environmental Studies. Professor McGregor is Anishinaabe from Whitefish River First Nation, Birch Island, Ontario. Professor McGregor's research has focused on Indigenous knowledge systems, and their various applications in diverse contexts, including water and environmental governance, environmental justice, forest policy and management, and sustainable development. Her research has been published in a variety of national and international journals, and she has delivered numerous public and academic presentations relating to Indigenous knowledge, systems, governance, and sustainability. Prior to joining York University, Professor McGregor was an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Toronto and served as director of the Centre for Aboriginal Initiatives and the Aboriginal Studies Program. She has also served as senior policy advisor, Aboriginal Relations at Environment Canada, Ontario Region. In addition to such posts, Professor McGregor remains actively involved in a variety of Indigenous communities, serving as an advisor and continuing to engage in community-based research and initiatives. And I think as the screens say, but I'll read it anyways, the title of Professor McGregor's presentation is Indigenous Environmental Justice, Knowledge, and Law. Professor McGregor, if you're ready. I'll try not to spill my water. That's my that's my task for today. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge the territory that I'm on, Algonquin Anishinaabe. I have actually lots of relatives. I have to go to meetings, and Verna McGregor does the opening, and we say hi, cousin. So so it's nice to still be on what I consider to be the great expanse of uh, uh, Anishinaabe um, territory. I also think it's very relevant uh, for today, so thank you for that land acknowledgement, um, to talk about how Indigenous knowledge, Anishinaabe knowledge, has been part of these territories for thousands and thousands of years. I'd like to remind people of that. Our own legal orders, our own governance systems were part of these, were part of these territories. Everything else is new to really, well, I guess a couple of centuries old, maybe, maybe younger, but, um, but, I, do, but I do want to remind um, people of that because it just provides a little bit of context for, um, for what I want to talk about. So my other goal is to try to make sense because I am, I'm thinking about some new ideas about where I want to go with, uh, with my work, not only my research like as part of being at York University, but work that I do for, uh, for First Nation communities um, primarily um, and trying to respond to priorities that they've identified um, to me in terms of what they'd like to, uh, what they'd like to work on. So all this is, is going through my mind right now as I, as I think about, or at least I think I've sort of uh, at least somewhat mastered the title of my Canada Research Chair. Because uh, when, I, when I left the University of Toronto and, and took the position, I thought, I actually don't know what that is. So my first job was to figure out what is Indigenous environmental justice? Because there really wasn't 
a field like it. So it was sort of trying to figure out how, what that looked like and how to define it. So I will talk about that. But now I'm at the point where I go, so where do I go from here? Now that I've sort of grounded it in um, Indigenous worldview, ontology, and the way people think, uh, as opposed to indigenizing other people's ideas, um, now where do I go with this in terms of, of trying to... Um, assist communities and, and move my work along to uh, respond to some of the big challenges that we that face all of us uh, these days. So I will talk a little bit about uh, climate change or how I might frame as being uh, climate justice since that's kind of top of, top of mind uh, all over the place at this point. Seems like every time I'm doing a, a talk right now, it's dealing with, it's, if it's not a specific topic, it's certainly the elephant in the room. So it's, um, so I will, I'm going to, I'll present to you some of my thinking around this and, and where I think I'm going to go, uh, go with it. Um, so I will talk about people, place and relationships, how I come to know what I know, why I think the way that I do, um, and, uh, and, and what I consider to be my priorities. And, and it really guides the kind of approach that I take um, to my research. And not only just my research, um, but also just in terms of um, my own relationships in the communities that I work with, because it's for me as a uh, Anishinaabek scholar, I don't. There's not a nice line between my research and who I am. There, it's always this constant uh, interaction and negotiation and uh, relationship. The sources of knowledge. Um, a lot of my research over the years has been. Uh, in relation to Indigenous knowledge systems, so I want to talk a little bit about the sources of it and why that might matter with, in thinking about uh, in thinking about climate change and what might be the solutions to that. Uh, the role of Indigenous legal traditions or Indigenous law in this. Uh, another area that I'm thinking about, what climate justice looks like. Well, we're climate injustice and what justice might look like. Um, and then I wanted to reflect on uh, uh, an elders and youth gathering on climate change that I facilitated. Um, at the time, I was just trying to get through the workshop on time and like, you know, trying to herd the cats a lot of the times. Um, but as I think back on it, it, it was extremely um, rich in terms and very influential in terms of how I think when I actually had time to think about it, when you're just past trying to get through the event to like now, now what, what were the instructions that I was given from this particular, um, from this particular gathering? And what that might mean in terms of self-determined futures. And, and there I think about uh, climate change futures in relation to Indigenous peoples, what a self-determined future might look like. So taking more of a desire-centered approach to things with Indigenous peoples and Indigenous research as opposed to what people call the deficit or the damage-centered approach um, to research and what that might look like. So hopefully... I'll be able to achieve this in the next 40 minutes. Uh, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions, which I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to entertain and, and get people's ideas. So some of you I recognize. So hopefully some things that, that are the core of my research um, don't bore you or anything. But, but it's all relevant. So why am I starting with this? Um, what I find with public policy, what I find with law, particularly in how internationally with the Paris Accord and Canada. Uh, well, Ontario, I guess there's no climate change with this government, uh, is, uh, is, how they, is how they develop a policy. And I think about even environmental policy. So I'm also, I also serve on the um, Assembly of First Nations uh, Environment and Climate Change um, Committee. Um, so constantly analyzing and looking to see what federal government's doing, pr provincial. And, uh, and one of the things that I found is, they, they don't account for the history of colonialism in Canada and the ongoing colonialism. And if it doesn't do that, um, then it's likely going to reinforce it. So this was, for some of you who were around back then, um, the main finding from the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People was that whatever Canada, for the last 150 years, their policies in relation to Indigenous people has been wrong. So let's not keep doing the same thing and having policy that you know, doesn't consider the real lived experience perspective based on the knowledge of Indigenous peoples. Otherwise, you're just going to keep repeating this. That was the main finding from Royal Commission. Um, as I say, after a really long time, like years of um, uh, public engagement and Indigenous engagement, I always said they could have saved a lot of money and First Nations could have told them that for free, right off the hop in five minutes. Um, so to me, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reaffirmed that. 
basically said Canada had a policy of, of cultural genocide. Um, and so it's important to think about uh, colonization in terms of policy. If you're not accounting for it in some way, then it's you're, it's probably going to be a colonial policy, really, from an uh, Indigenous um, perspective. Um, that's just a picture of the residential school that my, uh, that my mother went to. So then we hear the same thing from Murdered, Missing, and Indigenous Women's report just released uh, last week. Again, we have to account for this history and, and policy. Where I'm finding it... Um, so, which I think probably public policy might do a better job of doing that. We talk about decolonizing policy, trying to decolonize a lot of these processes. At least you hear that narrative. Uh, not so good at figuring out exactly what that looks like. Um, but, uh, but I've been on panels recently, and I started to think about this, and I would, I would challenge my co-panelists. I had to be the one for the shirk. They released the 16 challenge areas, and I was on the carrying capacity one. At, the, at Congress at UBC recently, and before that at another conference on, um, I guess it was uh, ecological um, economics. And people just like to show all these charts and all these figures and all these lines, and, and, I, and they're good, like especially the work in ecological economics and, and Professor um, Victor. But what I say to them is, how are you accounting for colonialism in that? You know, especially with uh, um, the smart prosperity where, like, you know, the, the, the capitalist market system is the answer to everything. I'm like, you're not really accounting for human rights in that or indigenous rights in that or the history of colonialism and how you're going to decolonize. And, and that just draws blank stares. But, uh, but to me, that's why it's important. Like, you, you have to understand indigenous peoples were here for thousands of years. We had our own ways of doing everything. We weren't perfect. I'm not going to say that. Um, the difference was when we made mistakes, we could solve it ourselves. Now it's hard to do that because we're having to deal with other people's laws, other people's policies, other people's um, constraints upon our, our lives um, and decision making. So understanding this history of colonization is relevant and important when we're talking about laws, when we're talking about policy, when we're talking about uh, knowledge. And these two, um, the inquiry and the commission um, have said, not only is it historical, it's all still here. So we need to always remember that um, and think about that. So people, places, and knowledge. So for me, um, I will have uh, an Anishinaabek bias to a lot of this, uh, although I do look at uh, Indigenous peoples, um, the, the work that tends to be generated uh, usually through environment sustainable development conferences, usually through the declarations, because I figure if Indigenous peoples got together from all over the world, different languages, different places, and decided on some, thing, some things, which is pretty remarkable, then, uh, then I respect that. Uh, I respect that a great deal. But for me, um, a large part of what I know is uh, people, places, and knowledge. So this is just my, my parents and, and my, my children. And what this reminds me of is also my responsibilities to where I am and to my ancestors and to future generations. Because despite this history of colonization, here I am. I mean, we know that you know, um, a certain prime minister wanted indigenous peoples to be gone after 100 years, but here we are. So, and that has to do with my ancestors and what they were able to negotiate in the treaties. Actually, I guess I have multiple treaties uh, that I have um, to enable me to be part of a nation. So I want to acknowledge that, and it still lives within um, my family. I am not fluent in Anishinaabewin, um, but this is another reason why family becomes really important because my parents are. And where I'm sort of trying to move with a lot of the work that I'm, that I'm doing is trying to center things um, in language because it's a very different way of thinking about, uh, thinking about the world. Um, and if I have time, I'll, I'll have a couple um, of examples. So this is where I try to ground my thinking. And I'm fortunate that I can just pick up the phone and ask questions that I know that a lot of... Um, other people, a lot of other scholars um, don't have. And my son's actually in a, um, a program, and he's probably, well, it's a two-year program. Probably at the end of it, he'll be fairly fluent um, in Anishinaabewin. So I interrogate him on a regular basis. <laughs> um, and again, this is, uh, again, just a place that I come from and, and some of the knowledge that um, surrounds, uh, that surrounds place that is going to be extremely relevant when we're thinking about a climate change future. Because to me, indigenous knowledge systems gives us that baseline that scientists are so desperately trying to achieve. I'm like, we got that. We know what that is. Um, and so that's important. I wanted to acknowledge teachers. So primarily, we're in an academic setting. Um, 
you know, I make my students do this too. When I write, I have to, we have to like cite. That's what we do. We read stuff and cite things. But it's also important, especially for me in the work that I do, that some of the, the teachers and where I've kind of had those big uh, aha moments where we're with who I call teachers. And both uh, both these teachers, uh, Josephine Mondalman and Robin Green, have, have passed away, but they, but they provided me with a completely different way of thinking about uh, thinking about questions. So they're, and, but because they thought in, an, they thought in the language, they thought in an Anishinaabe win. So they could take concepts that we were talking about and then see if it, comp if it made any sense in an Anishinaabe worldview and ontology, and then give a different explanation for what that was. And again, um, if there's time, I'll have opportunity to talk about that. But what that did was it influenced me to say, we're really limited in what we can talk about um, or from, from the research that I do, there's only so much I can learn from the written word. Uh, and I have to go back to community and talk to people who, who think in a completely different way to really kind of understand um, Anishinaabe way of um, thinking. Our teachers are also the land itself. Um, now this becomes very relevant to me in, uh, in thinking about um, what climate change futures might, might look like. Um, because it may be that despite how brilliant um, people can be, that was one of our gifts, we're also extremely destructive. And maybe we don't have all the answers. And maybe we need to look to other teachers and relatives for what some of those answers could be. Um, so that requires a degree of humility in the approach that we take. Um, and again, I, I won't have time to get into this, although I, I would have liked to, and I hate saying I'm kind of teasing you with these things I'd like to tell you, but I'm not going to, is, uh, is that in, in my view, a lot of um, Anishinaabe stories, for example, uh, the Pipe and the Eagle story, or even the, the recreation story, speak, they're actually climate change stories. They actually enable us and provide the teachings that enable us to be able to survive a destruction. Um, so, and this, and a lot of the, and a lot of that knowledge didn't come from people. It came from other, it came from other sources, it came from these other teachers and relatives that we have from the land itself. So this leads me into indigenous knowledge systems. Um, so the source of the knowledge comes from different places other than, uh, other than people. So this is just one slide of usually a whole course that I would teach on this. Um, so... So, but one of the things I, I want to say about Indigenous knowledge systems is that's important to, especially um, in the way the academy approaches it and the work that they do, um, asked to do sometimes very important work by Indigenous communities and organizations um, and government agencies, is that the approach is to not acknowledge that the knowledge actually exists within systems. Just like we're at Carleton University, Carleton University is part of a larger education system, how it's funded, how programs are approved. Um, provincially and otherwise, how they're run, who's considered to be an expert. So Indigenous peoples have their own knowledge systems. Knowledge is governed in particular ways. And so often our knowledge is only thought of as being data or information to be extracted for the use of other people. The recognition that it actually exists within systems that was intended to support the sustainability of Indigenous societies, people don't think about. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the methods is very extractive. Let's extract this knowledge from Indigenous communities and put them into these other frameworks, whatever they might be, policy, environmental assessment, whatever, uh, more models with lines and charts and things. And without recognizing it's actually part of a larger, um, a larger system of knowledge with its own way of governing um, what knowledge can be shared uh, or not shared. So to me, that's sort of one of the main, um, main things I wanted to, to say here. The other thing I wanted to say is that Indigenous knowledge systems uh, requires responsibility. That once you know something, you're to act on it. It's actually a verb. Um, in the Anishinaabe language, that would be uh, in Doswin, and it's a verb. It's a way of knowing. You do something. The way that we generally approach knowledge is more like a commodity, and we collect it. We put it on the shelf. It's in libraries. But in Anishinaabe system, it's alive, and, you, and you're expected to act on it. You're expected to, now that you know, you're expected to be a responsible person, uh, process it um, in some way. And um, other entities also have knowledge other than people. And again, that's hard for, <laughs> it requires humility, again, to be able to wrap one's head 
um, around this. And a lot of our knowledge was intended to um, support life and to um, understand what those responsibilities are um, and live up to them. And again, those relationships and responsibilities were part of um, all our relatives and part of all entities. So it's not just confined um, to people. So a lot of my research is around water justice or previously, well, actually, I still, I still work on it. And, and so the other entities, uh, water, which is considered to be alive um, and having its own being, also collects knowledge. So it's not just people who do that. So these other entities are collecting knowledge about what's going on, collecting knowledge about us, connect, collecting, uh, uh, collecting knowledge as well. And in indigenous research <clears throat> and methods, we have ways of knowing what they know. Um, so we had methods for, um, for doing that. So this isn't unusual in how we construct knowledge and how we would engage in research and what that looked like uh, for thousands of years because, of course, we were seeking knowledge all the time to uh, solve the challenges um, that we were facing. So that's just a, bit of, a tiny bit about the nature of uh, what Indigenous knowledge systems look like. And again, mine's very much informed by the um, uh, Anishinaabe um, tradition. And I've applied some of these in, in some of the work that I've done around uh, water governance and policy. <clears throat> so hopefully that's kind of making sense so far. All right, so what is this? Um, so then where do, where do I go from here? So when I was trying to figure out what Indigenous uh, environmental justice was, I had to, I started to look to different um, places for it. Because when I looked at the literature, I went, well, this isn't really Indigenous. It's it, like, not that Indigenous people don't experience all kinds of environmental injustices, they do. But it was more from a different lens. Um, and then Indigenous peoples were like the analytical piece, the unit that someone would apply the lens to to try to understand what's the nature of that injustice and how we might we try to deal with that injustice. And I was trying to frame it from, what does it look like? from an Indigenous perspective? What does it look like when it's actually grounded in uh, Indigenous uh, knowledge and laws um, and governance systems? So I started to look at what are Indigenous uh, legal traditions. Um, so these are just so two scholars whose work I like to use a lot. M.A. Kraft, actually at the University of Ottawa, <laughs> uh, does a lot of work around water law. Uh, and John Burroughs, who probably many of you have, have heard of, just has a, a, a cool new book out. Um, and um, Cecil King actually is, a, is an educator and he writes about uh, natural law and indigenous law. But one of the, the points I wanted to make here is that law is read from the land um, and that responsibilities is the heart of Anishinaabe legal traditions like knowledge traditions. It, it doesn't mean anything unless you understand what your, if you understand what your obligations and responsibilities are um, or to support life. And again, when you look at, look at the language, they see it again as very much like a verb. Um, which is consistent. A lot of uh, Anishinaabek language anyway, I don't know if I can speak for all the others, is that 80% of it is verb-based. It's actually, you actually have to make an effort to make it into a noun. Like that's actually, w like when you try to translate, you're taking something that's active and alive and verb-based and making it into, uh, making, um, making it into uh, a noun when then it, it doesn't have the same life that it did uh, that it did before. So this makes sense from an Anishinaabek language sort of uh, anthology. Um, so for example, so receiving a gift in well-being. So this is my family and our sugar bush. And, and here um, I was trying to understand the role of indigenous legal traditions or natural law in sustainability. Um, so the story that I wanted to tell here is in my family, so I'm like um, one of nine, my mother was a principal and a teacher, everyone's fairly well educated, I guess we have good jobs. And, um, and so I don't know who it was, but someone entertained the idea of that maybe we should like, you know, the, the pipeline approach to when people work in, in the sugar bush, I get, someone told me that's what it's called and I said how ironic. And, uh, and, but for us, we still kind of do it like the way that my family's been doing it for generations and, and generations. <clears throat> and my father said no. Um, so there's a Anishinaabek legal principle where he said, so for us, the, the maple, the sap comes at a time for the Anishinaabek when, um, when we would have been experiencing major food security. 
So this is in the spring. You're not usually hunting. It's hard to hunt because uh, the snow is really deep. Um, so this comes right when we need it. And it was, there's whole stories around how it came and it's considered to be a gift. It's considered to be uh, medicine, uh, medicine water. And it's very nutritious, it's full of minerals at this time. So when you, when you cross that line, um, so when we go to all the trees and they're not all tapped every year, is that you, we understand it as receiving a gift from that tree. But when you do the pipeline system, then you start taking from that tree. And that's when you cross the line. There's a difference between receiving a gift and taking something. Then it becomes tempting to take too much. You start to take more than you need. So there's a, a principle that, that guides, um, and you don't cross that line. Even though you can, you don't. Because a common perception with, among, uh, about Indigenous people was, oh, they were just too primitive to be like really destructive. I'm like, well, we could have, but we didn't because we had our own principles, our own legal principles that would guide um, appropriate behavior to understand that that's receiving a gift and there's a way that you receive it and, um, and, you're, not going to, and you're not going to take because that leads to, you, know, you go down a slippery slope. Um, and that to support well-being, not just of people, but also the trees and all life that it would also um, support. Uh, <laughs> So again, I look at our stories as also being ecological knowledge, but also uh, climate change um, stories. So this, I just like the muskrat because I really like the recreation stories. But essentially, to know indigenous law, you have to know the land. You have to know the environment. You have to know ecology. Um, and that's pretty well <laughs> the, the really the only way to really um, understand it. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to pull from shelves, uh, books on the shelf, and think that you're going to know indigenous legal traditions. So in Islamic natural law, so Cecil King uh, taught for many years at the University of Saskatchewan from Wiki, from the community my mother's from, fluent speaker, so he thinks, uh, thinks in the language. And what I wanted to emphasize in this particular quote is how we talked about our laws and our relationships wasn't just with us, but with other orders of beings. And that would be other entities, other beings um, in the world, in creation. So it's not just about us, it's also recognizing that they have laws as well, and we have to respect them. So it's not just people who make laws, there's other kind of laws, um, and we have to, uh, and our laws would enable us to be responsible to live in coexistence with other members uh, of other orders. So Minna Modswin. Um, so this is, an Ishnabe concept of living a good life. This is what we strive for. And initially, this was tended to be only talked about more in the health literature. So people talking about health, indigenous health, and Ishnabe health. Um, and then you started to see it in the environment. It's so usually starting, I find, with Winona LaDuc in some of her work. What is it? Why, why do we do what we do? Uh, and now starting to see it actually in, in some of the uh, indigenous uh, legal scholarship. Um, but why, but to me, one of the reasons why it's really important, because it's what we strive for. And what I found in the Indigenous Environmental Justice Scholarship is it's very diagnostic. Like it really likes to diagnose what the injustice is. Um, and they're really good at that. So same with academics, we're really good at that. Not so good at the solutions, like we're really good at diagnosing. This is like the problem and there's all these scales and, you know, but we're not so good at figuring out like what's the, what is, what is it that we're actually, what's the, what is it that we're trying to strive for? So in Anishinaabek thinking, what we're always striving for is Minunamazawin. So I started to think about that's what justice looks like. Like, what does justice look like? It was always like, what does injustice look like? Um, so I went, well, we, we already have these concepts. We are, they already exist. So for us, it's uh, Minunamazawin. And this is, what we, this is what we strive for. And our laws are meant to allow for those good relations. And again, these don't just apply to people. It always replies beyond the, always applies beyond the human dimension, it always applies to other beings and, and other entities. Injustice. So these are, these are some assumptions, I guess you could say. So what I've been, what I've been finding is that, um, you know, so we know about the IPCC report, things aren't looking good, calling for 12 years, I guess it was released in the fall, I guess it's 11 and a half years now. And, uh, and then the Government of Canada report on um, changing climate, it's not looking good. You know, World Health Report, climate change being the biggest health issue um, that uh, the planet, is, that people, I guess, on the planet are facing right now. But, um, but drawing on, on work from 
Zoe Todd, actually, who's here at this university, and Kyle White and, and others have said that, um, and it's true, that Indigenous peoples have already faced what other people are just starting to face. As I, This is why the genocide, the colonization is really important because we've already, we've already had to face our annihilation. We've already had 90% of our population decimated. We've already had to, we've already had to face major environmental change through um, relocation or the killing of the, we already had to, we've, we've already had, we've already faced it. We've already, we've already had to do it. Western countries are just starting to wake up and smell the coffee and go, oh my God, this might happen. We go, we've been there, we've done that, and here we are. So maybe we have something to say. Maybe there's something we can offer to this whole, um, to this whole discussion. Because we have been severely disrupted by these processes that continue to threaten everybody now. Um, but at the same time, our ability to be able to adapt like we've always done is constrained by colonial law policies and institutions. And that's why it's relevant to try to think about them as that colonization is still very much part of these, uh, part of these processes. Yet we've adapted and we have survived. Um, so to me, um, we, I think there's things to learn from, uh, from Indigenous peoples around this. Scum scholars write that, and, and I guess when you think about it, again, this history, this colonial history, when you think about what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was saying, what the murdered, missing Indigenous women's and girls inquiry was saying, is that Indigenous peoples are already living in a dystopia already. Like, we're already living in a world that is genocidal, has these genocidal tendencies <laughs> toward, toward you. Um, and, it, and it's not like it's gone away either. So it's still very much, it's still very much here. Um, and that we have to try to find solutions within this broader context that, that we live in, that other people are just starting to kind of face. Um, you know, all the dystopia novels and dystopia movies and, and things like that. It's sort of like, yeah, we've had to, we've had to um, face, uh, face a lot of that. One thing that we do that we do often pay attention to, again, is that we always go beyond the human dimension. So we're always thinking about what is the impact on the non-human relatives and teachers. So a lot of it tends to be very focused on what's happening with people, but we always go beyond what's happening um, to people to think about what is happening to um, what is happening to our relatives and what are they saying about climate change that we might have the inability to um, to listen to. So to me, that's sort of some of the context. Um, so environmental justice, what did I try to, after uh, looking at stories, thinking about indigenous legal traditions, what does our knowledge say about this? What do our governance say about this? Environmental justice, um, from what I can tell, indigenous environmental justice is, recognizes the earth as a being and an entity with rights and responsibilities, which you're starting to see internationally with the rights of Mother Earth, um, constitutionally in uh, Bolivia and other places. Uh, the rights of the river in New Zealand, um, but we recognize the earth as being a being, an entity with rights. Um, the solutions and responses don't recognize this. So think about how the water crisis, First Nation water crisis is being dealt with right now. It doesn't recognize that at all. Um, it tends to take a very technical, scientific kind of approach to, um, to fixing that. So it doesn't, it doesn't account for how uh, Indigenous peoples or First Nations people um, in Canada understand this. It doesn't deal with the damage already done, the historical trauma the, um, that's already been experienced by um, the environment or the other relatives. And then, again, trying to work through this and figure out how can justice then be achieved and how do we know? What does it look like? The, the other assumptions that I found with the environmental um, justice scholarship, and I'm going to say that I still think it's like really important. Like I would never say that it's not. It's like really important. It's just that indigenous uh, environmental justice is a lot broader. It considers different things. Its assumptions um, are different. So what I found with the environmental justice literature, it, it tends to have binaries. So people, it automatically seems people are separate from the environment. Things are happening to people because of stuff happening to the environment. And that's not generally how Indigenous peoples understand relationship to the environment. Um, humans' re re rights discourse is evoked. And I think, again, that's a really important, but it's limited because it's just focused on humans. And we always go beyond the human dimension in Indigenous um, thinking. Um, 
relatives water or forests are thought about as being resources or commodities or property. That's not how we think about those kind of things. So our so it's it's based on a number of assumptions that are different than what Indigenous people think about as being the problem and what the solutions might be. How might we achieve environmental um, justice? Um, I think part of it is renewing the covenant between people and the earth. This has been really disrupted. A lot of indigenous scholars, Val Napoleon at um, University of Victoria says, people are breaking our laws all the time. Like indigenous peoples get accused of breaking laws, provincial laws, we're like, but other people are breaking our laws, the laws that have been here for thousands of years all the time. This is how we've ended up kind of in the situation that we're in, that we need to start renewing this, this covenant and recognizing that you would have a covenant between people and earth, because we did. It's in um, some of the treaties where there's a specific treaty um, with the earth itself. Giving versus taking, part of legal principles and ethics, that's a very different way of being in the world. Um, um, I like this idea, well, I actually don't like the idea. It's an idea, the way that Robin Kimmermer talks about Wendigos, um, in in society that are uh, that consume. Basically, they're, they're this, monster, for lack of a better word, in Anishinaabek stories that consumes, it takes more than it take, uh, than it needs. And it basically threatens the whole um, community. So not a good thing. So again, we had stories for dealing with some of the things that we're facing now, people who are taking way too much and consuming. Um, and, uh, and she said that we have a choice between choosing the path of the Wendigo or the path of the Mazuin, which is living well with all of the earth. Um, so we do, we do have a lot of these um, ideas and how we think about and how we navigate through these uh, processes. So environmental justice, um, again, these are just some of the um, assumptions. How is it currently framed, the human nature divide? Um, but then what does a self-determined future kind of look like? Um, like, where do we kind of go from here? It's all kind of dreadful. Like, it's quite depressing. It's like, sometimes I don't want to hear about it first thing in the morning. Later on, maybe later, but not first thing in the morning. Um, so, Indigenous environmental justice. So, these are just, and when I was looking at it, so I call this more like the trying to indigenize environmental justice by recognizing indigenous peoples are unique, uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights, or particularly kind of indigenous state relations, whether that's fiduciary or reconciliation. Um, so, so people did, you know, in the scholarship try to account for this, but it's still not framed within an indigenous way of um, indigenous way of thinking. To me, there's a certain logic that you um, you apply to to thinking in this way. Um, so again, as I mentioned, I said we already had concepts of justice and what this might uh, what this might look like. And again, we always extend it to all our relations. We have to look at those kind of unjust re relations as well um, and try to understand what uh, what um, uh, appropriate and just relations look like. So, so what are again some of the limitations? The current dominant environmental governance frameworks and laws fail to provide environmental justice. They don't. Um, I think, you know, we know that through just about every single report that's coming. I, I can't remember the name of it that came out in the, in the spring on the number of species that are going to disappear. Like, not looking good. So whatever the system is, it's not working. Um, and so, uh, again, a lot of the policies, practices, they support ongoing uh, colonial agenda. Still very extractive and still very um, exploitive. So Anishinaabek logic, because I'm a researcher, I tend to think in terms of questions. Um, so what might this look like? What are the kind of questions that you would ask yourself as Anishinaabek that might lead us to um, a just future? One is, are we honor uh, honoring our relationship with our ancestors? And those include like your, your non-human ancestors, your relatives and teachers with each other, um, and future generations. Am I a good ancestor? Am I like even a good descendant for my ancestors? Um, are our relationships doing justice with all our relations? Is that what we're thinking about all the time? Um, what do our laws say about this? How do we ensure our relatives are living well? Again, because it's not just, it's not just us. Um, and our ultimate purpose is to sustain life for all relations. That's what, that's what our knowledge um, and our laws are to, uh, are to achieve. So there's a certain logic that we apply, a certain set of questions that we would ask ourselves. This isn't all of them. These are just... Um, the kind of questions that we would think about. So getting into what climate change, how does this then apply to climate change? And this is where my, my thinking is going. I'm, uh, in my work, it's probably one of the top issues 
well, probably priority issue in working with First Nation communities right now um, is how to is how to respond um, to climate change. Um, so, again, uh, a lot of what's happened in Turtle Island, North America, wasn't really our idea. Um, <laughs> And we weren't responsible for a lot of what's happened, but at the same time, we have to, we're, we're in it. We have to deal with it. So how do we? So how can we try to um, imagine a different kind of um, future? When we when what can we draw on um, that we already know that we've had to deal with survive, a severe environmental change? We already have this experience. Um, and this is where I talk about the Elder Youth Climate Change Workshop. So this was, uh, we held it in Thunder Bay, probably 70 plus elders and youth um, attended it. And they're not people who are reading all the scholarship and they're just coming together to talk about this issue of, um, of uh, climate change. And, uh, and, what, and this was actually coordinated um, by youth through the Chiefs of Ontario Young People's Council. So they wanted to talk to elders, they said, we want to understand elders' knowledge. We want to know what it is that we need to know. And elders very much wanted to talk to youth because they, they recognize that they have different kind of knowledge that's very relevant to understanding um, how communities might be able to respond to, um, to climate change and even what we understand climate change um, to be. And it's kind of interesting. Like when I think about um, what the IPCC says about climate change, how it's being defined, very kind of scientific, when we asked the elders and they basically said, well, it's greed. People are consuming way too much. They're taking, like, they had a very different idea about what it was. And I thought, we're just sort of letting this other dialogue kind of dominate our thinking. And then you keep thinking, if we can only do these things, that's the solution without actually really giving thought to um, what is actually causing all of this. So they, they had very different ideas about, and of course, they'd seen it through other environmental change that they had to face in their lives. So I was trying to bring people together, youth and elders, to, to talk about this. Um, and what they said, so what, so what is it that we are able to do that enabled us to be here? Um, what is it that enabled Anishinaabek resilience? And really what it was is our knowledge and our language and being on the land. That's actually what enabled us to, um, to survive and to adapt and to still be here. It wasn't like other people's solutions, like Royal Commission on Aboriginal People pointed out. It was like our own. It was our own knowledge. It was our own language. It was our own stuff that enabled us to be able to... Um, to um, survive. So that was uh, pointed out by elders and youth. And that's what enables our well-being. We can't rely on other people to decide what that is because it doesn't, uh, that really hasn't worked out that well for us uh, in terms of um, not self-determining what that, what that means for us. And that means being out there and it means being out on the land. It means being um, with elders. So one of the one of the emphasis of the elders, like if I were to divide it, because I actually had to write the report on this, so I did have to kind of try to analyze it, was elders were really focused on the healing of, of the earth, like healing of Mother Earth has to actually happen. That's what we need to do in relation to um, uh, dealing with any major severe environmental change, including climate change, and youth were really wanting to connect with the earth. That's what, that was sort of their priority. Um, so a lot of people talk about the um, generational uh, difference, but actually they agreed. They all agreed that language, being on the land, all of that was really important. They weren't off in different tangents about where, uh, what we needed to do. Um, and this is just a, a quote from, uh, from, one of the, uh, from one of the elders. Um, again, so really not trusting provincial federal laws and saying that maybe our laws might work uh, a little bit better. I love this quote from Dan Longboat for a couple of reasons. Some of you might know Dan Longboat from Trent University. is Because um, this is where you never see this in any of the climate change. I actually had a student go through the IPCC reports, all of them, Environment Canada's work, others, and just said, where do you find love in there? Tell me if you find this principle, which is central to how Anishinaabek think. But it's part of like the dialogue that elders and youth come together in. Like where we talk about different kind of things as being important um, in addressing this, this issue. And then we have an obligation um, to take care of our well-being, which requires taking care of um, other entities and beings. This is just uh, Indigenous knowledge. 
Um, and again, where, where elders have said, what's a priority? Priority is language. So the Language Act or the proposed, um, that's really important, believe it or not, to addressing climate change from uh, Indigenous or Anishinaabek perspective. Um, because you need to, again, because the language contains so much of the knowledge in the ontology and a, a different way of thinking. When I, I said my dad talked about that concept, the difference between take, like the gift and taking, it's, uh, I haven't, because I'm not very fluent and very clever in it, is it's actually an Ishtabek concept that I can never pronounce. And that's what he said. Um, so part of my work in the future is to try to understand those a bit better so, when you, so that you know uh, what are those principles for when you know that you've crossed the line. So language is really important to that. So a lot of people don't link language to climate change work at all. Indigenous people do. Um, so again, Indigenous legal traditions and governance. So... Basically, the current system isn't working. That governance and legal system is not serving the earth or people very well. Um, and so what do, we, what do we need? And it's not even like replacing anything. The way I would talk about it is Indigenous law is out there. Um, it exists just as it has. It's just not recognized or enabled or facilitated to be part of, um, to be part of uh, broader discussions. Uh, UNDRIP UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and Human Rights, again, they're exceedingly important, but they're limited because they don't recognize the other beings um, uh, that also have responsibilities um, and rights as well. So climate change futures, how to think about a climate change future? How does self-determination intersect with um, climate change? Um, and, and again, you see this criticism of the current laws and processes. And drawn away from our own laws, often people will talk about natural law. Um, but here is, again, where I thought it was really important, is that when are we going to stop taking and when are we going to start giving back? So again, um, Anishinaabe concept that I learned from the, the elders that I showed in the first few slides is our idea of sustainability isn't how do we keep up this completely unsustainable lifestyle that we have, which is a lot of what people get consumed with. It's like, in Ishnabit, get up every day and think about what's our gift going to be? How are we going to help the earth flourish? That's a very different way of thinking about how we relate to the planet and what sustainability is. And that's what they're saying here. Again, they're not reading all the literature. They didn't read anything I wrote on this, but they're hearing elders. Elders talk about this. What are we going to give? What's our gift going to be? As opposed to how are we going to keep taking in a sustainable kind of way, which is sort of the conventional definition of um, sustainable development. It makes no sense in Anishinaabewin. And when people in the language go, that doesn't make any sense, that's not what we do. Um, then they say, we think about what our gift is going to be. How are we going to enable the planet? How are we going to be able the Earth, Mother Earth, to flourish? Um, and again, the Kermit, the current, the way people are dealing with climate change isn't, uh, is, is failing. It's getting worse, not better. Um, what are our self-determined solutions? What did, what did this group say about this? And again, I, was, I want to take these up and try to figure it out, like what might this look like? Um, it's all again about the land. That's where we're going to draw our strength. That's what's going to enable us to um, survive into the future. Um, it's imagining what our future might be. And again, I like this slide because again, love comes up. And again, I'm like, it keeps coming up in the way that Anishinaabek think in the way, this wasn't just Anishinaabek either. This was all of Ontario. So it was Haudenosaunee and their six nations. It was Mishkegawat Cree, um, Oji Cree and Anishinaabek. So all the different nations in Ontario where love came up from the youth saying, that's what we need to think about. Do we like, do we love the earth enough? Like, do we, do we think it's, are we important enough to, to live well um, with the earth? So these different values and ideas, uh, ideologies come out from these uh, conversations. So what is, our, um, what is our future going to be? So this is just a shot of the youth um, that were there. Um, and again, trying to think in terms of what's this future in light of the challenges? What did we learn from what we've already had to deal with? And here we are. Um, what does that look like? What does that require um, for our future? Again, because all we're hearing is just how horrible everything are. And, and for Indigenous people, it's true. People are vulnerable. So you hear all the vulnerability oh, we have to deal with Indigenous people. They're so vulnerable, which is true. But that's because of the, a lot of the times the colonial constraints. You can't respond in the way that you'd like. Um, so, for example, in, the, in this gathering with, uh, with the elders and youth, so it was funded by, part of it was funded by Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, because there was a Ministry of Environment and Climate Change in Ontario at the time. There's no climate change. I don't even think there's an environment, Ministry of the Environment anymore. It got lumped in with something else. 
And so they, so they had their idea what the solution was, what the, what the climate change solution was. And they had their climate action plan, I guess so does Canada. Um, and, uh, and they kept pushing the, the participants to, to say, but don't you want a community garden? And don't you want like a greenhouse? Like they saw that as sort of the solution, the food security. And the people are like, no, we want to hunt and we want to fish, and we want to collect our medicines, which means you can't approve the stupid mine because that's you know, affecting the moose population. So they understood these connections. And then, and it was sort of like being in a room and listening to like, it, it was really weird, because then they kept repeating it. But wouldn't a community garden be really helpful? And they're like, we want to be able to hunt moose. Like it was, like, so people had these ideas of what the solution was, and people were saying something completely different that had to do with knowledge, that had to be on the land, that had to. And so, so we have to imagine our own future without the constraints of what other people think the solution is, um, which tends to be, you know, I mean, governments do this, and they're trying to solve the problem through uh, programs, but then you get limited by, uh, by the nature of the programs and what they consider to be an appropriate project, which all never they can never all be funded um, anyway. And I am near the end. <laughs> and so this slide just again speaks to what will our gifts be? In, in Ishnavik concept of uh, sustainability. We're not thinking about how can we keep taking so we can keep having this unsustainable consumer driven kind of existence. Um, it's more about what are what are our gifts going to be, not not what we can keep um, taking um, from the earth, and and in in our tradition we had um, fast. This was something I learned from the late Josephine Mondaman was people tend to think of it as um, a sacrifice because you're not um, eating or, or drinking for four days usually, maybe longer, sometimes shorter. Um, but really, what you're doing is you're is you're giving the earth a break. You're not drinking anything. You're not taking anything. So it's your gift back to the earth. So it's a completely different way of thinking about that whole um, experience and and practice and what its intentions are. Um, almost everything has all kinds of layers, and I'm kind of limited in my layers because basically because of my limitations in language. Hence why I call home a lot and why I interrogate my son every time I see him. So. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, to end with this. This is um, so a Norvell Morso painting, and, and the reason I like it because it shows all all the connections. And um, and actually, this is from uh, Isidore Day. If any of you have ever heard him, he's like totally amazing storyteller. Um, sort of lived most of his life outside the system, in in many different ways. And what he talks about in relation to this story is he talks about the times that we're facing now as a sacred story. The things are unfolding in a certain way, and we all have a role to play in the story. So we're all in this together. Like it's like having separations, like conflict. All like we're all in this together, and we're going to decide who we're going to be in the story. Are we going to be Windigo? Are we going to consume? Are we going to take? Or are we going to give? Or are we going to be? Um, are we going to support Namazuin? So we have a choice. We can, and we can be bit players in this too. Are we going to support? The Windigo, or are we going to support a life of Namadzuin? So he talks about that. We're all in this. It's all connected somehow. And to think about the times that we're in as being a type of, of story, and we're in charge of how that story um, can unfold. So to me, Gwetch. Oops. I have no idea what people are seeing. So we have a fair bit of time. Do you want to take questions now, or? I think so, because okay. yeah. I finished, I think, on time. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Thank you. I taught the environmental ethics classes a lot. And uh, to, to try to be brief, in, you talk about a lot of different concepts of moral theories all on a level. And I'm wondering how you would prioritize them, because a lot of time in the non-Indigenous philosophies, and I have to say many of them did draw on indigenous ideas, there would be what would be called the masculinist theories that concentrated on rights, individuals, and um, justice. Mm -hmm. And then there would be ecofeminism that would concentrate on love and caring and relationships and community. And they would prioritize things somewhat differently. And I'm just wondering if you have ideas about how one would prioritize whether justice comes first or communities and caring? I guess because I don't really see those as being really terribly separate. 
And, and you're right, like there are problems with the um, compartmentalizing and creating hierarchies. I remember being an undergraduate student, my undergrads in psychology, and looking at Maslow's theory going, that so doesn't work for Anishinaabe thinking, because it's like a this hierarchy, right, this hierarchy of needs, and I'm thinking, we think like in a circle, and, <laughs> and all of them would be central and important. So just as, as you were talking, I think what was going through my head was, again, that image that, that uh, I always have in my head when Isidore Day is talking, like everything's always connected. It's the way I also think about theory and practice, because there's a hierarchy there too, right? Worldview, ontology, ethics, and, uh, and that because we're probably most of us in universities, we, we, we think that theory is more important than practice. Um, which is that's what colleges do, and we do like theory. And uh, but actually, like our thinking isn't like that at all. Like the thinking and the and the theory are connected. Like I think of it, I don't really have the model in my head. I think of it more like a spiral, that it could go either way. Like they're actually directly, like they're the same entity. But it doesn't mean you can't think theoretically separate from practice. But it's impossible to have the philosophy without the practice, and the practice without the. Uh, without the philosophy, because they're so directly connected. Then us academics come around and be analytical and want to separate it all out. That's an Anishinaabek theory, and this is... So So we're kind of like doing something unnatural to to that kind of thousands of years of, of thinking uh, and way of being that um, that existed. So, so I guess, yeah, I think about it very differently. Like, I don't see the care separate, because that's... Because the justice is also to, to ourselves, uh, like Dan Longboat's quote to me is so important because of the, um, the health problems, particularly with youth, I don't even want to say it, but the, um, well, the high suicide rates. So part of it is like starting at that level to, and people see that as being very symptomatic of everything that, that's going on, that if you look at it from... Uh, um, a strong mind's perspective or, or caring for yourself. You care for yourself like you would care for the earth. That's, that's, actually, that's actually an obligation that we have. Um, I'm starting to look at that as actually being our understanding of a legal obligation is actually to take care of yourself and then you're able to take care of others. Um, I haven't gone there yet, but that's kind of, kind of where I'm sort of thinking in terms of that. Um, and working with youth to do that, because they think about this very differently. They don't want to think it like they don't like the other mental health issues. They're like, no, we want to talk about strong minds. And what does that mean from a uh, Haudenosaunee perspective or Anishinaabek perspective? Because that's actually how we thought. That's actually our, that's how we thought for thousands of years. And that's what we supported um, in, in terms of how we approached supporting life, I guess you could say. So hopefully that made sense. <laughs> it's hard to uncompartmentalize, I find, or unhierarchize thing, whatever it is. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Hopefully that all made sense because some of this is new thinking. Like I was putting this together, I thought I really want to talk about like where I'm kind of going with what I already know and all the stuff I don't know that I need to work with people, you know, who who aren't as constrained by their thinking as I am in my day-to-day -day life in a university. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Nearly 50 years ago, I spent some time with the Stony Indian tribe of the Blackfoot Nation in the foothills of Alberta's Rocky Mountain. And the memory is still very fresh in my mind and very dear to me. I was, I was, immersed totally in their way of life. And uh, I realized how precious it is. We don't have to go to India to a mystic to realize there is another dimension to life. My question to you is that you mentioned some challenges that indigenous people faced before the white newcomers mm -hmm. arrived. What were these challenges? How were they resolved? And are the same methods applicable in today's world? Yes. So um, it's hard, I mean, with the time to get into the, the whole story. But if you're, who's familiar with the Anishinaabek recreation story? Oh, well, one person. OK. Oh, a couple of people. So um, so we have a number of different, so the the. There's a couple, I think, that, that come to mind to answer your question. One is the, 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 um, the creation and then the destruction and then the recreation story. And mind you, there's all kinds of different versions. Like it, 
I was reading that maybe there's at least a different 140 different ones, but the one that people probably find the most is the um, the muskrat story, where the where the muskrat dives down and and gets to earth and brings it up, and then we we have a we have a recreation. But that destruction comes because people are not um, following basically um, in English, I guess, natural law. We've are, we've been given everything that we need to survive or to like to to be. I guess, to sustain ourselves as people um, with all of creation. We are given the laws, we are given um, how to behave properly, given the songs, given all the tools that we needed to do it, which is for us like the drum and the songs and um, the pipe and, and those kind of things. But we start to become arrogant. We start to not behave ourselves. We start to forget what our instructions are. We start to forget how to behave properly. Um, and there, there has to be a destruction because we're, we're not nice to each other. People get vain. People get arrogant. Um, and in the recreation story, uh, so the the animals, so when there's the flood, and again, there's different versions of this, probably the one that people hear most is Sky Woman um, comes and uh, and lands on the, the turtle's back. So the turtle comes to help her. And then the, all the animals try to find the soil so that, that life can continue on, uh, on, turtle, uh, on Turtle Island. But all the animals have to cooperate with one another. So there's actually a number of principles in that re to me, I see them as ecological principles. So I actually work with the story a lot and probably all my teaching. So in that story um, and how the animals help um, retrieve the soil and then create earth, there's actually a lot of ecological principles in that. There's a reason why the muskrat's the one that's able to do it, if you know the biology of the muskrat compared to the other animals. So it makes ecological, biological uh, biological sense. So then the, the earth is, is created again, and then we're given um, instructions for how to behave properly. So the reason why a destruction happens is when word one's not behaving. Everything else is doing what it should be doing, kind of like now, um, and it's humans who are the ones who are screwing up, basically. Um, so, so it's usually when we're not behaving, the, we're not conducting ourselves in the proper way with all of um, creation or with each other. In the, in the Pipe and the Eagle story, which is one that, so for many years I worked at the recreation story. I've written about this and said in a much nicer way than I just said because I have more time <laughs> in, the, uh, in the story to talk about it. But in the Pipe and the Eagle story, to me that one's a little bit, um, it's a little bit different. But the root of the problem is still the same. We've been given everything that we need to, um, to be sovereign, I guess, like in... In, in the lands that we that we live in. And again, people were, so we're given, that's why it's called the pipe and the eagle, so that we're given the pipe, we have the drum, we have our ceremonies, we have everything that we need to live in an appropriate, I guess, in the environmental realm, we'll say sustainable way with all of creation. And then we start not to do that. We start to become arrogant, we start to become vain, we start to take more than we need. We start to basically break those laws. And um, in that story, the, the creator, um, the creator, or actually that's really not right. It's probably more like a verb creation. The entity <laughs> decides they've had enough because we're, we're taking more deer. The other, other, you know, the other beings are not happy about all this and they're being uh, influenced because we were given will. Like we were, and we're smart, but we can also be extremely destructive about our smartness, I guess. And, uh, and so the, the, um, the creator um, sends a being to basically destroy Earth in like four days. And, um, and then the animals get together and say, um, we'd rather not <laughs> have that happen again. And so the eagle's the one that petitions to the, to the I'll, creation, I'll say, because it's probably more like a verb than a, than a noun, um, and, and says that, um, that they, all they need to do is find one, one person who's still following the original instructions. Um, that he's petitioning on behalf of future generations saying, yeah, these people are like kind of screwing up, but not all of them. I'm sure there's like somebody out there who's behaving themselves and still following, like still doing the ceremonies and still giving the offerings and still, you know, supporting, supporting life. So the creation creator says, okay, fine, go find them for me. You have four days to do it. Um, and that's at dawn. So that's considered to be a sacred time when, when time stands still, and that's when the, the eagle is able to go up. So the eagle is really important. Um, and so the, the eagle flies over four days. It's starting to get desperate. It's starting to become dawn on the fourth day. But he finds, <coughs> he does find um, 
one family who's still doing the ceremonies and, and following the instructions, even though there's all kinds of other people who are not. Starting to lose my voice. As it happens when you don't teach for a couple months. And uh, so the so the eagle finds this and then flies to the to the creator and says, I found found somebody. And then the, the creator holds back um, destruction. And so um, so in that story, people are again reminded to follow what those original um, instructions are to um, to to have the pipe, to have the drum, to have the songs, to have the ceremonies, to remember what our responsibilities are, to not be arrogant, to be humble. Um, and in the story, um, what it makes me think of, and I've actually written about this, um, because in, in the story, essentially, people don't like it when I say this, but people, we're not smart enough. So we have to rely on the other relatives to help us out. Um, and that's what our stories tell us. Like, this is why it's important to say knowledge is in these other places, because we can get too arrogant, we can get too vain, we start not being nice, there was violence, like they, they're describing all this dysfunction that was happening in, in Anishinaabek communities. Um, and and, and we, had, we had to be reminded to be humble and to not to be vain and to not take and to, uh, and all those uh, ceremonies and, and language and the gifts that were given to us to um, remind us, ensure that um, sustainability. So, so that's one story that I, I really like right now because a lot of the work that I want to do is what are, what are other entities telling us? So, so for example, um, if you have the chance in the Chiefs of Ontario website, there's actually a short video from that youth elders gathering. And there's this one woman, young woman, Jade Willoughby, her name is. Um, I don't, I couldn't, it's a five minute video, it wouldn't take too long, so I, there's not even me trying to, trying to guess what the timestamp is. And she said, really what climate change is, is the earth is trying to tell us something. That's how she understands it. The earth is trying to tell us what's going on and that we have to change. A completely, again, different way of thinking about what's happening um, to the earth and how we should be responding um, appropriately to that. So she's not reading the IPCC reports. She's not, she's just coming from a community perspective, listening to elders and understanding, um, understanding the stories. So to me, I'm starting to take that a lot more seriously and go, what are those other laws? What is that other knowledge that's telling us what's happening with the earth and how it's people who have to basically, um, basically be reined in. So, um, so in my mind, we already have, like we are, we already have those stories where, and it's usually because we're not we're not behaving appropriately and conducting ourselves appropriately and behaving in a way that supports um, that supports life. And it's our traditions, and it's our language, and it's our ceremonies that r remind us all the time to remember to um, conduct ourselves appropriately. And it doesn't take away from your uh, will, and it doesn't take away from your agency because we always have choices about how we want to be um, how we want to be in the world. So those are only just a a couple of examples because those are the ones I work with the most um, at the moment. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that sort of gives you um, a sense of that. I didn't do justice to these stories at all, by the way. <laughs> there, there's different versions and they're way more elaborate, but those are sort of um, the, the lessons that come from them. That it's, it's always beyond us. That's why I always say that. It's always beyond people and we kind of have to get over ourselves a bit collectively as humans to, to really try to um, face the challenges that we're, uh, that we're facing. So hopefully that answered the question. Well, actually it didn't. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm sorry to say it didn't. But you referred to it in your answer in, in some subtle ways. You said that we people have created this problem and we need to be reined in. Do you suppose that one of the things that we can do to this planet is not to have as many children as we have, we're having today? Would it be would it be fair to say that, See, I'm frowning. Mm. that every every woman every woman is entitled to be pregnant, but not to produce a whole tribe all by herself? We have um, other questions over here. Yeah, as well. I was going to say that that's just disturbing. But yeah. anyway, so yeah. so I'm in the Northern Studies program at Carleton University. Um, the reason why I came into this program is because in 2016, I'm from Northwestern Ontario, and we um, experienced a short winter or winter road season, and it was about two weeks. And so we couldn't, um, our communities that that are flying and rely heavily on uh, winter road season, um, couldn't um, get 
like fuel and things like that 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 we need for our First Nations communities. So that's the reason why I came into um, the Northern Studies program because our program looks at the Ar Canada's Arctic. So I wanted to see how, or I wanted to find out how communities in the Arctic were um, responding to climate change and the impacts of climate change. So that was the reason why I came into this program. And then um, it started to, <clears throat> my interest started to go more into indigenous rights of, um, um, of climate change because um, First Nations communities, there's little employment. We got like we got we got social issues and stuff like that. So um, I, with your youth and elders gathering, I was wondering if they shared the same um, interest of what Indigenous rights in the policy context of First Nations communities if there were um, um, concerns on that about, uh, um, say, like the lack of employment where, because this, this, this time there was like little time to get um, materials and personal items that we would normally travel 11, like number of hours to go and, um, to go and kind of, get the materials that we need for the whole year until the next winter road season because it's cheaper mm -hmm. um, and it's more cost effective for shipping instead of air shipping. And then in the summertime, shipping price costs go higher. So that's the type of stuff that I wanted to see, find out in this program. So I was wondering if that was uh, a similar concern that at your gathering was shared. Um, yes, I just focused on, I guess, the parts I wanted to focus on, but they did. They talked about um, treaty rights a lot. And this was in 2017, so a lot of the people who are from northwestern Ontario who were in it would have experienced just what you talked about. So a big part of it was identifying, like, the impacts that people are feeling from or the experiences that people are getting from climate change, but they did they did talk about Aboriginal and treaty rights not being recognized um, as being part of uh, as being part of the problem because it constrains people from from doing what they they want to do. Even um, you can think about the reserve system. That system constrains people, you know, because now people's movement is affected because you're because people are now dependent on when winter roads are to move goods in and out of communities. So no, that 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 was a big thing because a lot of the a lot of the people were actually um, were like ex like grand chiefs of the PTOs kind of thing. So they did they did talk about that um, and how rights are being impacted by decisions that people are making that. And, and again, a lot of the conversation around, but we really actually want to hunt moose because um, that's related to Aboriginal and treaty rights. And I, and I think about um, like the response from MOECC at the time is, but what about community gardens and, and uh, greenhouses? That keeps people off the land, right? Like you're not, <laughs> it was very, like to me, I started to see, that's kind of, I started to see it as being more insidious than, I, first I thought it was just like ignorance like, aren't you hearing a people? Then I started to think, actually, you don't want people out there on the land, like exercising Aboriginal treaty rights. You just want them to just like have a greenhouse and that's like food security. So, um, so the report is actually uh, on the Chiefs of Ontario website and it'll talk more about Aboriginal treaty rights. And there was a separate section on um, uh, food sovereignty because it's not just food security, it's also sovereignty. Like people want to eat what they want to eat. They don't Dan Longwell calls it colonization in the cupboard. Like, <laughs> you want to eat, like, you know. I mean, not like, it's not that people didn't like the idea of greenhouses or community gardens. People have gardens. They just didn't think that's the answer to climate change. Or, you know, they just kind of thought there's a bit more to it than that. But, no, they did talk about that. That was um, really important as uh, part of the conversation. And the youth just is... Um, just as concerned about that as uh, as the older folks. The older folks had seen it throughout their whole lives, like, you know, what's happened. Um, and uh, and the youth were really able to draw on um, their experience and trying to figure out how they want to deal with it. Yeah. We have time for one more question, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering if there was a key takeaway you wanted us to, like, get from this and not able to just pass on to other people who might not be as um, 
interested in indigenous knowledge, but also towards like our future generations, like to our children and our children's children, that we can give to them in order to help spread uh, indigenous knowledge and um, important information. Oh, that's like really hard <laughs> question. <laughs> I like to me. I think I would say it's always asking yourself a certain a certain set of questions, and one of them I think is, and to me, I always tie it back again to the. Um, land acknowledgement and acknowledgement that people were here for thousands of years, had knowledge and laws and, and everything else is, is to ask yourself what kind of ancestor you are. Like, what are you going to leave for your descendants? Like, all of us are going to be ancestors, right? So it's like, what kind of ancestor am I going to be? Um, and that once you know something, like, you then act responsibly based on that knowledge. It's not good enough just to take some notes and go, yeah, that was kind of neat, and then forget about it. Like, you actually have to... Um, which is not how we teach people at all, of course, but uh, we wait for the exam or the paper. So so I guess that's actually two take-home messages. But to me, the, I think the main thing is, what kind of ancestor am I going to be uh, for future generations? And future generations, not just people, future generations, but all, uh, but all life. That's a, a good question, actually. Thank you for that. The other hard question we got at the can't see one, the ecological economics was, was someone was says, I'm an office worker, what can I do? And we're just like, I'll stump the panel. Like, like <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't even know how to, yeah. So another hard question. <laughs> but thank you for that. That was actually easier than, what should I do? I'm an office worker. Anyway, so. okay. well, thank you very much. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. A small gift from the uh, Faculty of Public Affairs at Compton University. Thank you. Just, uh, everyone's comfortable with knowing that we're like the dumbest of all the entities on the planet, but no one is, <laughs> everyone's okay with that. Most people are like, what? <laughs> Some days it's not a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to reiterate what I said just now. I uh, wanted to thank Deborah for an excellent lecture and on a really important issue. and. I've, you know, as a as a, a, a neoclassical or liberal economist, it, it made me makes me think a little bit about um, issues, and and uh, you know, I think you've raised a lot of important issues that I think can be integrated into our way of thinking about the world. So uh, I appreciate that on a personal level, and I think the size of the the audience and and the enthusiasm demonstrates that that you know we as a society are are very interested in your work and and uh, and learning more. Um, and maybe I'll just give a quick plug that, you know, don't forget where we are. We, we, uh, we'll have lots of events next year, and, and uh, please look at our website, and we look forward to seeing many of you back again. So, thank you. Thank you.